Uh, welcome to Space Ape. Thank you all for coming. My name is Tom Martin. Uh, I've been a Scala developer for a little over five years. Um, <coughs> three of them here at Space Ape. I've been working with the JVM for a little over 10 years. This is my first job in the games industry, uh, and I can't recommend it highly enough. It's a really fun and challenging place to work. Um, first, uh, the, the name of the talk is Creating Massively Multiplayer Strategy Games with Scala and DynamoDB. So uh, this is going to be talk about how uh, we make mobile games here at Space Ape uh, and how we use Scala and DynamoDB to uh, solve some of the challenges we face. But it's also a little bit of a story, might be a familiar one to some of you, of uh, a development team picking up Scala, learning about it, and how the technologies we build using it sort of reflect those learnings. Um, <clears throat> I'll just introduce Space Ape a little bit. So uh, we were founded in February 2012. Uh, in that time, we've launched five titles, Transformers, Earth Wars, Rival Kingdoms, and Samurai Siege. Um, they're all broadly strategy games, all for mobile, uh, played on iOS and Android, uh, tablets, tablets, tablets and phones. Uh, and between them, they've been played by over 30 million players. Uh, our next title, Fast Lane, is coming out soon. We're very excited about it. Um, it's a move away from the strategy genre. Uh, it's a scrolling shooter, and it's coming out soon. I'm not allowed to say when, but uh, very, very, very soon uh, this summer. So watch this space. Um, first, uh, I'm going to talk about Scala, uh, how we use it at Space Ape, and, and why, why we started using it. Um, our clients are all built in C Sharp. Uh, they use the Unity game engine. But meanwhile, the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the servers are 100% Scala. We've been 100% Scala since uh, day one. Uh, uh, we've got a wide range of experience with the language. We started with um, two founding employers, employees who are very, very familiar with Java, but we're picking up Scala for the first time. Uh, we've since hired a uh, bunch of Scala experts and others less familiar with the language. When we hire, we don't hire specifically for Scala developers. Uh, we hire for engineers with uh, strong technical backgrounds uh, and then uh, expect them to learn Scala on the job. Um, and that is somewhat reflected in how we use Scala. So uh, we're not strictly functional or particularly academic. Uh, we use quite a lot of sort of uh, old school uh, Java technologies. So uh, we use Maven uh, rather than SPT. Uh, I can see some of you wincing already. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> test NG uh, rather than Scala test, although we have played around with it a little bit in some of our products. Uh, Drop Wizard, uh, Drop Wizard for Scala as an application framework. Uh, and, and Jenkins for CI, so betrays our sort of Java developer roots quite, quite, quite a bit. Um, so that's uh, what, how we use Scala, why. Uh, I wasn't actually around when, um, when, when this decision was made, so I went to the, the horse's mouth, our founding CTO, Toby, uh, to ask him uh, why, why we moved to Scala. Um, it sounds cool and hipster. It did, didn't it? Back in, in February 2012, it sounded really hip. Uh, but I think what he really meant to say is that when you've been working in one language for a long time, it feels really good to learn another one and learn different ways of doing things. Uh, and those developers um, really uh, were very, very much familiar with the JVM, so it was great to be able to leverage that. Uh, again, probably a familiar story to, for a lot of you. Um, also, at the time, uh, a lot of... A lot of uh, Companies were moving from Java to Scala, particularly the ones with a stronger engineering background. So Tabby really felt it would help hiring uh, more experienced senior engineers. Uh, and I think that sort of proved out with the team we've built here. Um, uh, hedging against Oracle, screwing up Java. Uh, Tabby used much more colorful language for this, so I've toned it down a bit. Uh, but I guess five, now Java's in a pretty good place, but five years ago, perhaps uh, this paranoia was justified. Um, so uh, yeah, Scala was perhaps a way out if, if things went, went wrong with Java. Uh, but finally, and crucially, uh, the team tried it out and they liked it. So uh, they tried it, tried writing everything in Scala for two weeks uh, and decided that although they'd be less efficient in the short term, in the long run, they, they'd be, uh, be more efficient and they really liked using the language. Um, so uh, you might be asking yourselves, why does a mobile game need a server? Uh, you might have played games like Candy Crush or uh, Angry Birds or something like that, and apart from some light Facebook integration, everything seems to be happening on the client. Um, but our games have five main sort of sets of uh, requirements that, that require the server. So the first is persistent. Uh, our players play on multiple devices, typically a phone and a tablet, uh, and we allow them to seamlessly switch between the two uh, because we store all the data on our servers in the cloud and um, authenticate with iOS 
Game Center or Google Play. Likewise, if they lose a phone or get a new one, there's a seamless uh, data recovery step uh, because all of the data is stored in the cloud. Um, auditing, so our games are super fun, but they're also very, very competitive. So uh, and our players pay a lot of money for the privilege of that competition. So if anyone uh, cheats, uh, which is um, not only uh, an inevitability, but it's also quite common. Uh, we'd like to be able to uh, detect that hacking as soon as possible and stop it uh, before it negatively affects other players' experiences. Uh, likewise, if we ourselves ever have any bugs, um, that they could also uh, corrupt an account or cause a, cause a poor experience, then we like to catch them as soon as possible. So typically, uh, the clients, the player will be doing some actions in the client uh, and those actions will all uh, be sent to the server and validated and checked uh, one by one to make sure that they all uh, they all look good and, and, and there's no there's no bugs or hacking. Um, multiplayer, our games are, as I mentioned, our games are very competitive. So uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of um, requirements to for any action a player takes in the game needs to be communicated to all the other players in, in that play in the game. So any leaderboards need to be updated in their real time. Uh, the players group into large alliances fight each other uh, and uh, chat and uh, donate troops and things, and all this needs to be mediated by the server. Um, content delivery, so we have a very rich CMS controlled by the uh, product designers uh, and product owners of the game. Uh, we can push this out to the clients without having to go through the Apple release cycle. Um, and we also drive a lot of revenue in our games by uh, running weekend events. Uh, we, we call this process live ops. So that's content delivery, finally indexing. Players need to be able to find each other, find friends, uh, find alliances to join. We can recommend alliances to join, find other players to attack. We call that matchmaking, so that's indexing. In terms of these requirements and how we solve them at Space Ape, the first three are broadly solved by some kind of persistence, and we've chosen DynamoDB for this. Uh, the content delivery is, is typically we put files on S3 and serve through uh, AWS, AWS to CDN, Amazon CloudFront. So that's um, fairly typical. Uh, and then indexing, we use Elasticsearch for search uh, and Redis for things like matchmaking. Um, so uh, this is a talk about DynamoDB, so I'm going to focus on those first three sets of requirements, persistence, auditing, and multiplayer. Uh, the, uh, the indexing is probably a talk in itself, so if you want to hear more about that, then grab me afterwards and I can fill you in. Uh, but yeah, we're going to focus on persistence, auditing, and multiplayer. So. Uh, I'm going to talk about DynamoDB a little bit. So um, in, uh, first, I'm going to introduce you to DynamoDB. If you're not familiar with it, it's um, Amazon's NoSQL store for AWS. It's primarily a key-value store. You store data in a column-based format against a hash. Uh, it also has range tables and secondary, secondary indexes. So um, a range table would be a hash key with a secondary key uh, with, of ordered data. Uh, so you can store uh, ordered data against, say, a player ID or something. It needs to be well distributed. You can't put all of your data in a single hash key uh, and sort it all in one range table. Uh, the uh, Dynamo won't like that very much at all. Uh, but uh, with these three features, uh, you can generally cover like 95% of a typical RDBMS system as long as you structure your data in the, in the right way with some denormalization. Uh, the other interesting feature of Dynamo is you don't pay in terms of... Uh, virtual machine hours or um, uh, per node, you pay literally for the reads and writes that you expect to consume uh, ahead of time. So uh, if, you, uh, <coughs> if you pay for 200 write units uh, a second uh, and then start consuming 250, uh, Dynamo uh, won't just slow down, it will actually start erroring and refusing to serve the requests. We call that throttling. Uh, again. Handling the auto-scaling of Dynamo and uh, avoiding this throttling is, again, probably a talk in itself. Uh, so if you want to hear more details about that, also grab me later. But um, the other thing to know about Dynamo is that eventually consistent reads are half the price of consistent reads. They, tr they try and encourage you to use eventual consistent reads. Um, that's not just to reduce your costs. Uh, if there's a failover or an outage in Dynamo, then strongly consistent reads and writes may not take place and, and result in errors, but eventually consistent reads will generally be affected. So really, the high availability strength of DynamoDB is only there if you stick to eventually consistent reads. Okay, so why, why Dynamo? Why do we choose to use it? Uh, the first one is scale. Uh, the three games I talked about earlier, uh, Rival Kingdoms, Samurai Siege, and Transformers Earth Wars, all uh, serve 
uh, at their peak, hundreds of thousands of daily active users. Uh, for transformers, it's over half a million, um, and it's peaked the AU. So that's a huge amount of scale, and the, 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 the software applications being games, they generate a lot of rights. Every single action a user takes in the game, we need to persist. They could be tapping around the phone, uh, harvesting resources, training troops, doing whatever, and they can generate a lot of rights. So uh, Dynamo, uh, more than, if you, as long as you provision the throughput up front, it more than, uh, more than meets those requirements for us. Um, Cloud-based operations, so Dynamo has been, being an AWS product, has been uh, one of the most reliable and stable parts of our stack. Um, and it's very easy to use, uh, configured via, either via the console or via an API, and it allows a team of two server developers and a uh, single operations engineer to, to go from nothing to serving tens of thousands of writes per second in less than six months of development time. So it's been very easy to use. And the, the pay-as-you-go uh, format that I mentioned earlier means that as a, as a young startup as we were five years ago, it's very much easier to manage our costs and being able to find grain control, how many read units and how many write units we were paying for. There weren't any unexpected bills at the end of the month. So challenges that we face with DynamoDB, as I mentioned before, lots of writes per player. Uh, the player's tapping around the phone, they're doing a lot of different things. Uh, every single one of them, we need to persist. Uh, we need to audit. Uh, we, we potentially need to communicate to other players. So there's a lot of potential writes, and this means a lot of high throughput costs. Uh, additionally, our services are generally state-based HTTP services for the sake of availability and operations. So not only does each action correspond to a write, it typically corresponds to a read as well. A read to get the player's information, then a mutation, and then a write. Uh, so yeah, potentially have very high throughput costs. Uh, additionally, the writes could come very closely clustered together. A player could train a number of troops within a short amount of milliseconds. We need to record all of that. Uh, if they're all individual requests to Dynamo, then there's a chance that a single, an initial request uh, could cause a mutation. Subsequent requests could read stale data from the slave. It could be some kind of corruption, you know, errors, uh, all of that bad stuff. So uh, yeah, two main challenges, high throughput costs uh, and eventual consistency issues. Uh, and happily, we've uh, found a solution for the, for, that serves both of these issues, uh, batching. The, the requirements I mentioned earlier, persistence, auditing, and multiplayer, while they have near real-time requirements, that requirement is in the order of seconds, not milliseconds. So uh, we're actually able to batch requests on the client and flush them, for example, on a summary siege every five seconds or so. Um, <coughs> most of the requests, like training troop and harvesting resources, for example, uh, don't actually require a response, an immediate, re immediate response from the server. This is because the games themselves are games. They're very, very, very rich clients. They, maintain all the state themselves in the client. So they don't typically have to wait for a response to the server. So batching is very possible for us. Uh, if a request does require a response, for example, fetching a leaderboard uh, or making a request uh, around some kind of alliance gameplay that requires a response, the, the client can flush those requests immediately and, and get a response, but generally it doesn't need to. So batching, batching really serves our needs. Um, obviously, the benefits are fairly obvious. We can reduce our throughput, one read and one write per batch rather than for each request. Uh, and because the clients are artificially spacing out those requests on the client, we're spacing out the requests to DynamoDB, so we're giving plenty of time for the slaves to, to propagate all the information within Dynamo. Uh, we're avoiding the eventual consistency issues I mentioned earlier. <coughs> uh, excuse me. Uh, there are some implications to using batching. Uh, when it comes to development, so REST doesn't really support uh, a way to do to batch um, a lot of mutations to the same to different resources. Uh, so rather than use REST, uh, we've gone for an RBC-based approach when designing our APIs. Um, the uh, HTTP itself is also doesn't really have a concept of batching. So uh, we use a custom protocol that we've written in Google protocol buffers. We were already using. Uh, protocol buffers for um, the sake of compute, uh, CPU and network performance on the devices, but it's also been super useful for defining this protocol. Uh, it's kind of what it was designed for. And finally, uh, to batch up these, these, all this uh, work uh, and have it only mapped to a single read and write per batch, we've had to write a fairly sophisticated database layer, as you might imagine. So finally, I'm going to show you some Scala um, and show you uh, that database layer. Uh, we call it Hydra. It's got two functions. First, it's an ORM, 
um, for Scala that wraps the Amazon uh, DynamoDB client, uh, which is a Java-based client. Um, <coughs> it, uh, as long as you extend this persistent abstract class uh, and then add some annotations, uh, it, uh, it, it, can, it can marshal data in and out of Dynamo uh, and, and give you these, these uh, Scala classes back. Obviously, uh, a lot of you are probably noticing all these var keywords. Uh, it, this also really betrays our sort of Java development roots. Um, the uh, Hydra not only uh, encourages a mutable data model, it actually requires it. Um, and uh, uh, because it's, it's quite an old technology, we wrote it five years ago, some of you are shaking your heads. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't use Scala macros for this metaprogramming. It doesn't even use Scala reflection. That didn't exist when we were writing this, this uh, technology. Uh, it uses Java reflection. So again, just like our choice of technologies, um, it's, it's, it somewhat betrays our sort of imperative object-oriented roots, and it really uh, sort of uh, encourages that style. <coughs> uh, the, other, uh, the other thing it provides is a Hibernate-style cache that allows us to do the batching that I mentioned earlier. So uh, every, if we've got a batch of RPCs, the first batch will uh, load the first request from DynamoDB uh, via Hydra and then perform some kind of mutation on the player. Uh, the second request, when it hits Hydra, will get returned literally the, uh, the same reference, the, a reference to the same object that the first request got. So the, the player data that gets returned will reflect all the mutations of this previous RPC. Um, uh, that sort of explains why we have this sort of mutable model uh, within, the, within the data model. Um, and then when the RPC is finished, there's one single call, called the hydro.flash, and then it writes it back to, to DynamoDB. So uh, yes, it does encourage a very object-oriented imperative style of using Scala, uh, but it also very much meets our needs in terms of the batching, uh, which, which allows us to handle all this high throughput uh, and avoid the eventual consistency issues. Um, however, as we've grown as an organization, hired more Scala devs, learned more about the feature set of Scala, we really felt like Hydra was holding us back a little bit in terms of the style of Scala we could write. So uh, we since wrote a new uh, database layer, we call it Momo. Um, this, uh, uh, Momo allows us to uh, define all of our data model just in nice, clean, standard uh, Scala case classes. Rather than enforcing mutability, it enforces immutability. It's got a much uh, richer support for the type system within Scala. Uh, map, list, set, and option of any type. Uh, Hydra previously only supported lists and options of strings. Um, we configure Momo uh, data models via uh, type classes and Scala macros. So any misconfiguration gives us uh, compile time errors rather than runtime errors. Um, I'll show you an example of this. So this is quite a lot of boilerplate. Uh, we're trying to make it look a little more attractive, but you only really need to do this once per, per uh, object in your data model. Um, you can see we're configuring the name of the table, uh, the, uh, the uh, name of the hash key and the type, and where to find it in the object. Um, and then we're defining two serializers, uh, a write serializer and a, and a read serializer. Uh, this is all written using Scala macros. Uh, but because we've used type classes, if we wanted to use something other than Scala macros for serialization, we could switch out. So the type classes kind of allow us a certain amount of dependency in injection, uh, rather than always being stuck with the same reflection. Uh, macros themselves are notoriously hard to debug uh, and maintain, and we've discovered this. There's, um, there's at least one developer at SpaceApe who's got quite a bit of job security until we share this knowledge around the team a little bit. Um, but we are working on it. <laughs> uh, the, the, the caching layer that's sort of implicit in Hydra is now optional in Momo. So um, we create a DynamoDB client, the, the regular AWS one, we pass it to Momo, and then we've effectively got a nice RRM for case class based Scala. And then if we, if we want to use the caching layer, uh, it's, it's, there, it's available. We just pass Momo to the constructor of caching Momo. Um, some sort of caveats uh, Momo isn't sort of solving all of our problems, it's not like uh, some kind of panacea. Like if you, if you do like really, really strictly functional code, we still don't really write that here at Space Save. Uh, you explicitly call save on the, on the, on the objects you want to update. Uh, so we're still somewhat uh, imperative in terms of our Scala style. 
Uh, that's not just really about our database um, layer, it's really about the sort of the style of code we write here. Um, we've load tested uh, Momo uh, to uh, levels of traffic beyond those uh, live games received, so we're pretty confident in terms of performance and things like that, but it hasn't actually been put into production yet. As I mentioned, uh, Fastlane is the first game that's using Momo and it's, it's not out yet, so this code isn't actually in production yet. Um, Additionally, Fastlane, in terms of server technology, uh, is slightly less complex a game on the server side, so it hasn't actually been used in quite as uh, complex a code base. Uh, but yeah, um, Fastlane coming out soon, powered by Momo. Uh, did I also mention we're hiring? Uh, come and talk to me or any of the other uh, apes around the room if, if, you're, if you're interested in solving some of, some of the problems that we face here. Uh, and uh, you might not have to work with Hydra. You might get to work with Momo. Um, so uh, <coughs> that's, uh, that's, that's, that's everything. Um, hopefully I've given you a good overview of the challenges we face here and the technologies we've used to, to solve them, but also uh, probably a, a little bit of a story of Space Ape's history with Scala.